This lecture will cover chapters four and five in Johnson and Christensen. Chapter four introduces the sections of a research pr proposal and provides details pertaining to the writing of research proposals. Chapter five is concerned with the myriad aspects of research ethics, including how to submit your proposal for review to the Institutional Review Board. Let's begin by examining the framework of a research proposal. A research proposal is a written document that includes a summary of prior literature, the identification of a research topic and research questions, and a specific procedure for answering the research questions. Overall, the purpose of your proposal is to sell your idea by showing how you have thought it through very carefully and have planned a good research study. There are three major sections of a research proposal, although the exact headings can vary. Ours will be introduction, review of the literature, and method. Two examples of table of contents for a research proposal are shown in Table 4.1. In this course, we will use the three-chapter approach, in which the literature review is separate from the introduction. The first chapter of your proposal is titled Introduction. The purpose of this section is to introduce your research idea, establish its importance, that is, you want to sell it to your reader, and explain its significance. To guide the flow of the introduction, you should begin by establishing the need for your particular study and explicitly state the purpose of your research study. Then, you should state your specific research questions and briefly outline any limitations of the proposed research. Finally, you must define all key terms as they will be used throughout the paper. The second chapter of your proposal is titled Review of the Literature. The purpose of this section is to provide a convincing argument within a fully developed conceptual framework that your study is not only important, but will also contribute to the existing body of literature pertaining to similar topics. The process for reviewing the relevant literature was outlined in Chapter 3. Remember, the review should lead directly into restating your research questions and providing relevant hypotheses. Chapter 3 is the method section of your proposal. In this section, you provide a written description of the specific actions, plan, or strategy you will take to answer your research questions. It should include information about your proposed research participants, design, apparatus or instruments, procedure, and your proposed data analysis. The subsection of the methods section, entitled Participants, should provide a written description of the individuals who will, per who will participate in your research study and how they will be recruited. Be sure to specify the following. Their demographic characteristics, such as age and gender. Inclusion and exclusion criteria you will use. And any inducements for participation you plan to use as well as where the participants are located. If you do not have access to the participants you intend to use pending proposal approval, you should provide the best estimate of the sample's characteristics as possible. For example, if I intended to complete my research at the neighborhood elementary school, I would use the CDE's website to get demographic information about the entire school. In this subsection of the method section, entitled Design, you present your plan or strategy to be used to investigate your research questions. You must include a separate design section if your design is complicated. Otherwise, you can put it in your procedure section. The following is included in the design section. First, the type of design and design layout of your study. For example, you might use a pretest, post-test control group design. Second, a description of all the variables being examined in your study. Third, a description of how your variables are to be combined. And fourth, a description of the points of measurement and manipulation in the design. In the apparatus or instruments section of the method section, you describe any apparatus or instruments you propose to use in your research study. The following information should be included. First, a general description of the apparatus or instrument. Second, the variables measured by the instruments. Third, the reliability and validity, when available, of the instruments. Fourth, a justification for why you chose these instruments. And fifth, a reference indicating where they, 
the instruments or apparati can be obtained. Whenever possible, include a copy of the actual apparatus or instrument, for example, the self-esteem, self-esteem inventory, in the appendix of your proposal. In the procedure subsection, in the method section of your proposal, you will carefully describe how your study will be executed. The following information should be included in the procedure section. First, a description of the design, if it was not previously described. Second, a detailed step-by-step description of how the study will be executed. The reader should know exactly what you intend to do after reading this description. It should include enough information to tell the reader how to do the study if he or she wanted to replicate it. Finally, the data analysis section, analysis section of your method section describes exactly how you propose to analyze the data you plan on collecting. In a quantitative study, you will use some type of statistical analysis. You will need to specify those analyses and justify why they were chosen. In a qualitative study, there is no one right way of analyzing the data. You must explain the approach you propose to use and justify its use. In general, qualitative analysis will involve coding and searching for relationships and patterns in qualitative data. Mixed research uses multiple data analysis methods, both quantitative and qualitative. Table 19.8 in Chapter 19 will show some general types of mixed analysis. An abstract will be required for your research proposal in RSM 5120. It should be the last thing you write for your final proposal document. The elements of the abstract will include the following. A concise statement of research hypotheses or research questions. Statement of the expected number and characteristics of participants. A brief summary of the procedure or the way in which data will be collected. And a brief statement of how you will analyze the results. Chapter 5. Research Ethics. What are research ethics? Ethics is the division in the field of philosophy that deals with values and morals. It is a topic that people may disagree on because it is based on people's personal value systems. What one person or group considers good or right might be considered bad or wrong by another person or group. In this chapter, we define ethics as the principles and guidelines that help us up to uphold the things we value. There are three major approaches to ethics that are discussed in this chapter. First, the deontological approach. Second, ethical skepticism. And third, utilitarianism. The deontological approach states that we should identify and use a universal code when making ethical decisions. An action is considered either ethical or not ethical, without exception. It's a very black and white approach to ethics. The ethical skepticism viewpoint states that concrete and inviolate ethical or moral standards cannot be formulated. In this view, ethical standards are not universal, but are relative to one's particular culture, time, and even to the individual. Finally, the utilitarianism approach is a very practical viewpoint, stating that decisions about the ethics should be based on an examination and comparison of the costs and benefits that may arise from an action. Note that the utilitarian approach is used most by people in academia, such as on institutional review boards, when making decisions about research studies. There are three primary areas of ethical concern for researchers. First, the relationship between society and science raises questions about how much societal concerns and cultural values should affect research. Should researchers study what is considered important in society at a time? Should the federal government and other funding agencies use grants to affect the areas researched in a society? Should researchers simply ignore societal concerns? There are many relevant examples of the relationship between society and science in our current media. For example, stem cell research and abortion rights are both highly volatile topics because of the relationship between society and science. Second area of concern is in the realm of professional issues. 
The primary ethical concern in the realm of professional issues is fraudulent activity, that is, fabrication or alteration of results by scientists. Obviously, cheating or lying are never defensible. There are two types of publication issues to avoid. Duplicate publication means publishing the same data and results in more than one journal or other publication. This should be avoided. Partial publication involves publishing several articles from the data collected in one study. This is sometimes allowable, as long as the different publications involve different research questions and different data, and as long as it facilitates scientific communication. Otherwise, this too should be avoided. The third area is the treatment of research participants. This is probably the most fundamental ethical issue in the field of empirical research. It is essential that one ensures research participants are not harmed physically or psychologically during the conduct of research. In the next section, we will go into the issue of treatment of research participants in depth. One set of guidelines specifically developed to guide research conducted by educational researchers is the AERA guidelines. The link is shown at the bottom of this slide. The AERA is the largest professional association in the field of education and is also known as the American Educational Research Association. Participants must give what is called informed consent before they can participate in any study. That means par potential research participants must be provided with information that enables them to make an informed decision as to whether they want to participate in the research study. An actual consent form is shown here in Exhibit 5.3. Also, Table 5.2 outlines the information that you, the researcher, must put in a consent form so that it, potential participants are able to provide informed consent. There are a few cases where an IRB will waive informed consent. If the study proposes minimal risk and or participation is anonymous, cultural norms preclude getting consent, or signing the consent form itself would subject a person to legal, social, or economic risk. Informed consent with minors as research participants involves another step. Informed consent must be obtained from parents or guardians of minors. Also, assent must be obtained from minors who are old enough to have enough intellectual capacity as to say they are willing to participate. Assent means that the minor agrees to participate after being informed of all the features of the study that might affect the participant's willingness to participate. So far we have only talked about active consent. That is, when consent is provided by the potential participant signing by the consent form. Active consent is usually the preferred form of consent. Passive consent is the process whereby consent is given by not returning the consent form. An example is shown in Exhibit 5.5. Here's the key passage in the passive consent form. Participation in this study is completely voluntary. All students in the class will take the test. If you do not wish for your child to be in this study, please fill out the form at the bottom of this letter and return it to me. Also, please tell your child to hand in a blank test sheet when the class is given the mathematics test, so your child will not be included in the study. Deception is present when the researcher provides misleading information or when the researcher withholds information from participants about the nature and or purpose of the study. Deception is allowable when the benefits outweigh the costs. However, the researcher is ethically obligated not to use any more deception than is needed to conduct a valid study. If deception is used, debriefing should also be used. Debriefing is a post-study interview in which all aspects of the study are revealed, such as the purposes of the study and the reasons for deception, and any questions the participant has about the study are answered. Debriefing has two goals. The first is de-hoaxing, informing and debriefing study participants about deception that was used and explaining the reasons for its use. The goal here is to restore trust. Second, desensitizing. Desensitizing helps study participants deal with and eliminate any stress or other undesirable feelings that the study might have created in them. 
Desensitizing should explain that their behavior was normal. Participants must be informed that they are free to withdraw from the study at any time without penalty. If you have a power relationship with the participants, for example, if you are their teacher or employer, you must be extra careful to make sure that they really do feel free to withdraw. Protection from mental and physical harm. This is the most fundamental ethical issue confronting the researcher. Fortunately, much educational research poses minimal risk to participants, as compared, for example, to medical research. Finally, confidentiality and anonymity. Confidentiality is a basic requirement in all studies. It means that the researcher agrees not to reveal the identity of the participant to anyone other than the researcher and his or her staff. A stronger and even better condition, if it can be met, is called anonymity. Anonymity means that the identity of the participant is not known by anyone in the study, including the researcher. An example would be where the researcher has a large group of people fill out a questionnaire but not write their names on it. In this way, the researcher ends up with the data, but no names. The IRB is a committee consisting of professionals and lay people who review research proposals to ensure that the researcher adheres to federal and local ethical standards in the conduct of the research. Virtually every university in the U.S. has an IRB. Researchers must submit a research protocol to the IRB for review. A full example of a research protocol submitted to the IRB is shown in Exhibit 5.6. Finally, let's discuss ethical issues in electronic research. Some of the questions that are important include, is informed consent required for all materials found on the internet? What is public and what is private? If we determine informed consent is needed, you must apply the same principles via the medium of the internet. It can be difficult to maintain privacy of data collected via the internet. But just like any other educational research, research conducted electronically might require debriefing. Finally, we must discuss the issue of authorship and plagiarism. Authorship goes to the individuals who made a substantial contribution to the conceptualization, design, execution, analysis, or interpretation of the study. Helping collect, enter, or analyze data does not usually warrant authorship but does warrant acknowledgement in a footnote. Do not ever plagiarize when writing the research report. It is a type of stealing, and it is highly unethical. Plagiarism refers to using the work produced by others and presenting it as your own. For short quotations, put the material in quotation marks and include a citation, including a page number. For long quotation, that is quotations of 40 or more words, use the block quotation method, that is, indent the entire quotation, set off as a block without quotation marks, and include citation and page number. Finally, self-plagiarism refers to using one's words as original when they have been used previously in another publication. This presentation was built using the original PowerPoint presentation and lecture notes provided by authors Johnson and Christensen on the instructor and student websites, which accompany the fourth edition of Educational Research, Quantitative, Qualitative, and Mixed Approaches. I have modified the slide content and script to match our needs, but the original content is still copyrighted by Sage Publication.